none of my earliest gaming videos feature any commentary. The gameplay videos I watched didn't have any commentary either, and truth be told, I myself detested the very idea of commentary. The way I saw it, the goal of any gaming video should be to draw the most out of the game possible. But talking drowns out the music and breaks the immersion, and is therefore inherently counterproductive. I think this attitude comes from originally uploading walkthroughs of old games that most people couldn't figure out how to run on newer machines anymore, so I didn't want their only experience left of the game to have some guy talking over it. Eventually though, as Let's Plays and so forth exploded in popularity, I finally decided to give it a try. You might know the story of the Miller brothers while they were making Myst, and how at first they didn't want to include music in it because they thought it would detract from the game. But once they tried it, they realized instead that it enhanced the game in ways they previously didn't imagine. I figure my experience with gameplay commentary was similar to that. It transformed the medium into something quite different and allowed for a whole new set of possibilities. However, that doesn't change my opinion that a gamer voice inherently puts a damper on the viewer's ability to experience the game. So my approach to commentary is that whatever I decide to do with it, it better be good enough to make up for lost ground. I dipped my toe in the water by recording a sloppy speedrun of King's Quest V. I think that kind of backdrop naturally breeds excuses for poor commentary, so it was a little less intimidating to start out. Considering what it was, I think it was a pretty decent attempt, although I'll admit I'm a bit embarrassed by some of the things I said in it now. Then I made a series of guides for each of the puzzles in Lost Mind of Dr. Brain. This one was quite a bit more organized, and it's where I practiced the art of saying everything you need to say in 11 minutes or less, which was the time limit for YouTube videos back then. But even though I technically played these games start to finish, a speedrun isn't exactly thorough, and Dr. Brain isn't a full-fledged adventure game. So Real Mist was my first full commentary playthrough. I will confess, it wasn't so much that Mist was my favorite game or anything, it just seemed like a good place to start, with its own lack of dialogue or any direct communication to the player for the most part. My reasoning was that commentary could take on the role to bridge that gap. When I first began recording my series for Real Mist, I took the opportunity to just go at my own pace, goof around, and basically do whatever I wanted. I made the deliberate choice not to care about any pacing requirements or what anybody else thought I was supposed to do. But even in those early moments, I did have a general plan for the order I wanted to visit all the locations in the game, and the kinds of things I was willing to say about them along the way. I've always believed in the show-don't-tell approach, which puts a lot more constraints on your options than you might think, both in what you say and where you go. You'll notice a dramatic evolution in my style from start to finish, because even though I vaguely understood the principles going in, I still had to figure out most of it mid-flight. And after a few uploads, I wisely made adjustments based on viewer feedback, despite my original intentions to not care what people thought. Then once that video series was complete, I made another series playing through Myst 3 Exile. This might surprise you, but this is actually the original game I wanted to dub a commentary series over. Again, it wasn't due to it being a Myst game though. This time I saw Savidro as a compelling character, and one that I could play off of rather easily. And while he appears just often enough to maintain a strong presence throughout, most of the game is still a silent world ripe for commentary, as I just described. I'm glad I went back and covered Real Mist first though for some practice, since I learned a lot of things in the process that helped make my Exile series much better than it would have been. For a while I thought about covering the games in order, but as everyone who's been around here knows, I ended up skipping Riven. I'm going to dedicate a separate video of this series to that game, so I'll wait until then to get into the reasons. Then I also made some DVD menus to complement each series. Not that either series needed anything like that, but it was a fun and interesting challenge in and of itself to try to make. I especially like how the Exile submenus look with the motion thumbnails. The Real Mist submenus weren't as exciting, but at least I made a better version of them than the ones I uploaded to YouTube back in the day, so I recently put those up too if you want to check them out. The videos used to function with actual buttons that would take you between the menus and link to the scene selections in the series. 
But that all broke when YouTube brilliantly took down its versatile annotation system in favor of monotonous clickbait generators like end screens. The menus were actually part of a larger challenge, which was to see if I could convert each series into its own physical DVD. It's actually a Blu-ray out of necessity due to how big the file sizes are. I can't really say why I did all this, other than just to see if I could. I like how they look though. I still have a few copies lying around somewhere. I should host a giveaway or something. All that was stuff I made years ago, but then last year I went back and remade the entire Realmist series. This version has some previously unused commentary, as well as higher quality video and audio. I already went into the details of all that elsewhere. I guess the point of mentioning it here is that I must instinctively look at these series as my own personal movies that should last a lifetime, rather than social media posts that last a week. Of course, this is different from when I'm streaming. If I'm just gonna hit the record button and goof around for a few hours, that really is just a social media post, so I don't mind that it doesn't get any attention after a week. It's not exactly a creative endeavor. But if those are the two opposing categories, this puts the standard sit and go let's play video in kind of an awkward position. If there's no planning going into it, then why not stream it so you can get a live chat going? And if there is a plan to it, why not go all the way with that and make a polished video that has optimized gameplay and commentary? A middle ground that has some preparation but also accepts a bunch of stuttering and missed opportunities in the game doesn't have much of a role to play in my book. I guess the argument is that the output can still be reasonably frequent, but it's still not something I find myself very interested in making. I'm sick of hearing myself trip over my own words. I have a hard time pinning down exactly what to call these polished videos though. They're not exactly scripted since the final product doesn't actually match the script. Instead, the script is often adjusted after the fact to fit the gameplay recording. I also don't think they are actually Let's Plays, since that usually brings to mind the sit-and-go variety of videos. I've painted myself into a corner calling my videos that in the past, but now I think that's the wrong label. At least for the later stuff, and probably what I'm envisioning for the future. Going forward, maybe I could give it a similar label. Like, Shady Plays. Something short and recognizable, but different enough to clue you in maybe something's up. If anyone can think of a better name though, please let me know. The reason I think it should have a different label is that it is fundamentally different from a Let's Play. It's not just a Let's Play with an obsessive amount of work put in. I've had a hard time putting my finger on it and always tried to explain it in terms of certain properties my videos have, such as pretending to not know the answers to the puzzles. But one day, when I showed my channel to one of my friends, he just blurted out, Yeah, you're playing a character. And in five seconds, he gave a succinct description I couldn't come up with in five years. A Let's Player plays a game as himself and describes the game from his own perspective. I've been playing the games as a character who is describing the games from that character's perspective. Think about what actors do when they exaggerate human behavior for their performance, by definition they're departing from natural behavior. So they aren't genuinely trying to fool you into thinking they are in fact the characters they portray, as I've been accused of a few times. But on the other hand, everything they do is an attempt to draw you into the story and characters, and to get you to suspend your disbelief. And we as the audience go along with it because we want to believe them, despite the fact we know that stage behavior does not match real life behavior. Yeah! Yeah! Oh! Courage, man! Ooh, the hurt cannot be much! No! It's not so deep as a well, nor so wide as a church door, but it is enough. It will serve. Ask for me tomorrow when you shall find me a grave man! The wrong play! I am peppered! I hey, so if these actors can play the part of fictional actors, why can't I as a gamer play the part of a fictional gamer? Of course, just as these actor characters don't behave like real actors, my gamer character isn't always going to behave like a real gamer either. Watch any ordinary stream when I'm actually trying to get through a game and you'll know what I'm talking about. Sometimes I'll breeze right through sections of the game while probably missing some fun details while getting stuck and frustrated for hours in other spots. Typical for anyone, really. Now, a scripted series doesn't have to do that and instead offers the luxury to steadily progress through all areas of the game at about the same speed. It has implications though if you want to play a character at the same time because he's no longer as realistic. 
But that's to create a better experience for the viewers, so I'm not saying that makes the character somehow invalid. You just get some moments that stick out like a sore thumb. A good example was discovering the mechanical fortress rotation in my Real Mist series. There are multiple Eureka moments the player must have to put the pieces together and solve this. Ideally, the player finds the controls on top of the elevator and recognizes the goal is to try to bring those down to their level. They have to understand what the middle button does inside the elevator, and they have to notice there's a waiting period during which the player can still move. And finally, the player has to put it all together and work out the strategy of exiting the elevator during the waiting period. Realistically, either each of these will take some time to recognize, or the player will just blunder into the solution accidentally like I did as a kid. There's no way around the unreality of a character who figures all this out smoothly. So who is this character I'm playing in my videos? Since I myself was only recently made aware I was even playing a character in the first place, it's not an easy question for me to answer. I guess this character is just me for the most part, at least in terms of his personality. Of course, the main difference between myself and him is that he doesn't know the answers to the puzzles. However, he's also a sponge. He doesn't have to see anything more than once to learn everything about it and make all the logical inferences he needs to. Of course, this is to smooth out the pacing of a playthrough as I just talked about. I'm certainly not this way. Furthermore, this character can be tailored for a particular game. I'm not sure what that means exactly, but I think it has to do with adding immersion. As I mentioned earlier, in Exile I wanted to play off Savidro, and I'd say I accomplished that well enough. So if I am tailoring my character, then he can't just be me in a vacuum. I've seen some gamers who do play their own characters, but oftentimes they'll play the same character in every game as an overall bit they play on their whole channel, and therefore the character isn't adjusted for each game. So that's not what I'm talking about here either. There's even some ambiguity as to whether my character is even a gamer at all. Even though he interacts with the environment using the same keyboard and mouse interface that I am, he often behaves and reacts to things as if he is physically present within that world. Maybe he is the mouse cursor, I don't even know. This conundrum may be a result of me making the most out of whatever each moment calls for, or perhaps just not thinking this through beforehand as well as I should. Maybe all this will come into focus when looking at the larger context and the overall goals I try to keep in mind when planning out videos. As I said at the very beginning of this video, the primary goal of any formal playthrough should be to display as much of the game as it has to offer. It doesn't need to bog down into an encyclopedia, but if you know about something that's remotely interesting and can be included in a reasonably efficient path, then you probably should include it, ideally in the aforementioned show-don't-tell fashion. The second goal is to stay in character. This is why my character doesn't know the answers to the puzzles. It's the most immersive way to present the solution and immersion helps with goal number one. On one hand, this goal is easy because the character is basically me, but on the other hand, it can be a challenge to maintain the nuance in every single moment, mainly because certain spots can get really tricky like the fortress example. The last goal is to be consistent throughout the series. If you're playing a character, then you're telling your own story parallel to the games. So this goal overlaps with number two, but it also extends to style and pacing, also don't contradict yourself, unless you're portraying an evolution within the character. Unfortunately, this goal is a problem because the previous two are often in conflict with one another. How am I supposed to show off all the random trivia about the game while playing a character who supposedly doesn't know anything about it? You can occasionally get away with a fake discovery process, but a smart audience isn't always willing to accept this. In the past, very often I've opted to sacrifice consistency and just make the most out of each individual moment. This violation has taken different forms. I might just break completely out of character, or I'll go back and forth between a gamer at my keyboard and a person inside the game's world. These are often temporary just so I can show what I need to show in the game. This kind of thing may never completely go away, but going forward I'd at least like to execute these moments better somehow. I don't know if there exists a satisfactory solution that hits all three goals in all cases, but any time I cave and put a break in the performance, I risk losing the immersion that was already hard enough to build up in the first place. Playing a gamer as a separate character already subverts expectations. Subverting them again risks killing the whole thing. 
I don't claim to be an expert, so I hope I don't sound pretentious. I don't even claim to be particularly good at this. And besides, I only have two ancient series under my belt. The reason I'm sorting through this now is so I can make something better in the future without having to misplay my way through more games in the meantime. So here's how I honestly think I did back in the day. Both what I did well, and not so well. The character I played in Real Mist was pretty goofy, especially early on. I understand why some people found him annoying. Over half the commentary was unscripted in this one, so this can be chalked up to feeling a bit awkward having no proper experience, and not yet having solidified the ideas I've talked about in this video. But even in the earliest phases, I can see I did have some intuitive grasp at these concepts. Like here, shortly after I enter the first room, I try to jump on a ledge using the spacebar. I myself already knew the game had no jump command, so obviously I was just playing a character who didn't know that. I think this is an early example of show don't tell. I could have just stood on the docks and spilled all the beans at the beginning, but there's presentation value in not standing there forever and explaining every detail up front. That being said, it was probably a bad idea to do this, since it has no relevance to the room or respect for its mood. More importantly though, this early scene also has a consistency problem, because right before that, I talk about how the original game doesn't allow you to walk behind the imager. Does that mean my character is just someone who has played the original game and not the remake? Well, no, since he also hasn't figured out what the imager is yet, which means he doesn't know the puzzles. Like I said earlier, it's pretty much impossible to show all my knowledge of the game without sacrificing at least some consistency with this character. However, in the future, I'd like to handle this problem in such a way that doesn't stand out this badly. As far as the goofy character goes, if I were making a new series of Myst from scratch today, I probably would not use that personality. But the more I think about it, it may not be as bad as I once thought. He is a stark contrast to the subdued environment around him, but how unfitting is that really? He just came from a faraway place, so the contrast may actually make sense. Furthermore, he has no idea of the troubled history of the place, so perhaps he just enjoys the getaway island. Maybe his life was miserable back home and this is a welcome change. Who knows? His attitude does mature over time, sort of, as he learns more about his environment. This may have been an accidental phenomenon as I started taking the role a bit more seriously, but if it fits, who cares if it was a coincidence? Now on to Exile. When I reviewed my series in preparation for this video, for the first time I consciously paid sole attention to my character. I knew I was fairly consistent with it overall, but I was surprised to see how well I managed to stay in character pretty much the whole time. Apparently it was really important to me, even if I couldn't articulate the concept back then. Here's an example of how I handled my player character properly. In Savidro's laboratory, there's a painting of a woman's face with her eyes smudged out. Having just read Savidro's journal, my character speculates this is Savidro's wife based on the text there, which is correct, but then he says, but there's really no way to know for sure. That's not actually true. It's essentially confirmed after we watch Savidro's third monitor message on one of the lesson ages. I knew about this all along, but I'm not speaking as myself. I'm speaking from my character's limited perspective, who will only piece things together as new information comes in. But I didn't always handle it properly, to be fair. And here's just one example. Shortly after I note the painting, I find weights that balance some scales. These scales provide clues for balancing a bridge later in the game. I should just note the raw information here and move on, since my character doesn't have an application for it yet. But instead I stand there and start multiplying out the conversions as if it's important, when my character has no reason to believe it is. Maybe he could note it slowly and carefully so the viewer can more easily remember it, but going to this level of detail is probably too much. Besides, it's redundant anyway since I definitely have to go over the conversions while solving the later puzzle. It may not ultimately be a big deal, but it's one of those things that stands out to me when I revisit it. There were other times I knowingly cheated on my character's limited knowledge, and revealed extra information shortly before it's revealed in the game. Unlike with the scales, I stand by my past self doing this on occasion, because the benefit of added clarity far outweighed the small sacrifice of consistency in those cases. I did this for a few of the puzzles, but the best example was my Janan and Observatory speeches. 
These served as checkpoints between lesson ages to take a break and recap what we recently uncovered about the story. For the most part, I stuck to journal entries we'd already found, but sometimes I figured it was clearer to prepare the viewer for an entry we would find in the near future. Since Savidro's journal entries are found out of order, the story can be hard to follow, especially in a video series when you can't review them at will. So helping the viewer through subtle foreshadowing seemed a more appropriate role to take on here. In summary, as I've gained experience, I've become more aware of character inconsistency. So it won't surprise you to say I do prefer my performance in Exile, even though I'll admit there's something nostalgic about the Real Mist series. I actually put more deliberate character work in my Space Quest videos, and to my own surprise, even in the recent Fly Mode videos. But that's a topic for another day. So that should give you a solid idea of the vague idea I have of the character I want to play in my videos. As much as I like it though, I've also had reservations about it too, because of its departure from the cultural norms of gameplay commentary. Many people have told me they find what I do to be unsettling, because they come in clearly expecting something else. But some people also seem to like it, so since it's what allows me to be creative, I'm going to try to stick with it. More importantly, as I've fleshed these ideas out, I've come to believe the style has massive amounts of untapped potential, as long as I can figure out how to do it justice. So let me know what you think about all this. Next, I'll go into the construction of a series itself, in which the character is just one component. See you in part three. Do you know me, sir? Am I Gromeo? Am I your man? Am I myself? Thou art Gromeo. Thou art my man. Thou art thyself. I am an ass. I am a woman's man and besides myself. <laughs> The, the, the what woman's man and, and how besides thyself? Mary, sir, besides myself, I am due to a woman. One that claims me, one that haunts me, one that will come of me! What claim lays she to thee? Mary, sir, such a claim as you would lay to your horse, and she would have me as a beast. Oh, it's not that kind of show. 